Um, I want to say thanks to the organizers, especially Amy, Sven and Sybil. Thank you so much for really excited about this conference. Thanks for inviting me. Um, really excited about the topic. Uh, and then finally, just a very quick word, uh, some parts of my talk and presumably also the q and I'm going to be bringing up uh, causes of cancer and, se and also sexual assault, just to let people know about that. Okay, so the question that I want to explore today is to what extent the proof paradox in epistemology differs from or resembles a couple of other seemingly seeming paradoxes, the lottery paradox on the one hand, and what Mike has helpfully dubbed in his comments, the profiling paradox. On the other hand, what are the similarities and differences there? And the name of those three are right at the top of the hand out there, lot uh, lottery cases, prison yard cases, and iPhone cases. And what I want to talk about is to what extent these are illustrating the same kind of paradox, a kind of lottery paradox, compared to what are they what, to what extent they're actually epistemically different from each other and need a different epistemological treatment. And I'm going to be exploring this question through the lens of thinking about what modal epistemology says about the cases, about the paradoxes, and in particular focusing on safety. And so in some sense my paper is aiming at this meta question. To what extent can the apparatus of epistemology um, illuminate issues of profiling through epistemological tools rather than say needing the offerings of moral philosophy or legal um, considerations or social considerations uh, and then to tackle this larger meta question I'm going to be focusing on this very specific topic what does safety have to say about the cases okay um, there's a hand there's a handout ram just to let you know and there's another one left there's all gone sorry, ah. sorry about that so go to the website <laughs> <laughs> okay so <laughs> So the proof paradox uh, in epistemology is typically constructed by something like pairing the following two vignettes. So prison yard case, there's like 100 prisoners and they're exercising in a prison yard, and then suddenly a riot begins, 99 of the 100 engage in this premeditated attack on a guard. One of them stands with, one prisoner stands with his back against the wall refusing to riot. And so it seems like um, on this kind of evidence, and there's no specific evidence here, about which prisoner refused to riot. But it looks like, plausibly, um, the evidence I've just described suggests for, each, for any particular prisoner, the, they, the, the prison guards could be, the, uh, the people that run the prison, the warden, could be sort of 99% confident that any particular individual prisoner was rioting that day. The thought is, what if they, they now um, prosecute that person for assault, assaulting the, the prison guard? Um, it looks like that there's a high chance that that belief, that that verdict is going to be true. Doesn't look like it's going to actually ever fly in a court of law, that kind of evidence, that merely statistical evidence. Contrast that with a case where a far smaller percentage of the prisoners um, participate in the riot, participate in the attack. But now from a long distance, a prison guard says, oh, it, uh, this person, he, he was one of the attackers. That's the kind of evidence that could plausibly fly in a court of law even though overall, the overall likelihood, the overall statistically likelihood of being uh, true in that case could even be, could be lower than in the first case where it's merely statistical evidence. They're the, the two cases that sort of make up the proof paradox. Uh, so yeah, plausibly the former case, the, the best statistical evidence doesn't suffice, even though the latter case is less likely to be true, the belief is less likely to be true, but it's the kind of evidence that could uh, lead appropriately to a prosecution. Um, and the pair of, so the pair of cases kind of begin to suggest that, that statistical evidence is insufficient for satisfying the beyond reasonable doubt standard, something more than high probability of truth is required. That's the kind of idea behind the proof paradox. So, um, and I'm going to refer to the, the pair of cases as the prison, prison yard cases, because uh, rather than calling them like the proof paradox cases, because part of the question is going to be to what extent does that kind of example exemplify that kind of paradox. I've got three cases that it seem to exemplify three different paradoxes and then the question is to what extent do they actually do this and how messy can things get. So the structure of the paradox might well seem familiar. It bears a striking resemblance to the lottery paradox in epistemology and this is something that I'm going to return to below so if you don't know what the lottery paradox is don't panic. Uh, we're going to be returning to lotteries and Mike is also going to um, well, if you don't know what the lottery paradox is, let me know. I've just realised, I was going to say Mike is going to say what it is, but that's, that might not be true anymore. Uh, 
<laughs> well, sorry about that. At some point, uh, we'll get back to lotteries. If you don't know what the lottery paradox is, like, let me know and we'll, we'll, we'll say what it is. I'll say what it is. Okay. Um, okay, so the proof paradox was first discussed in about the mid-20th century by law scholars. It was uh, picked up by Judith Jarvis Thompson in her 1986 paper. And then in recent years, it's become increasingly discussed by epistemologists, particularly in the last 12 years, but even more so just in the last sort of four or five years. It's really gaining some traction among people who are within the epistemology community. So the puzzle is explained, as I said, why bare statistical evidence doesn't suffice for legal verdicts. And, um, and what other conditions need to be met. And then various answers to these questions, of course, produce these other questions, like, well, if merely statistical evidence can't suffice on its own, can it play some role? What's an appropriate role? And how can the sort of role that it does play interact with the fact that it doesn't suffice? Another question it raises is, if we're rejecting bare statistical evidence, given that it's probative, does that mean that we're taking a hit on our expected um, reliability of verdicts? There seems to be that we'd be accepting a higher error rate, like having more false, false acquittals, acquittals where we should have convicted. And how is this consistent with the epistemic aims of the legal system, which seem to be something like determining what happened. So Pritchard argues that his modal epistemology can resolve the proof paradox. And he argues it's a mistake to focus on the aims of the law courts, the aims of the legal system, as just reducing error in this way that this second question seems to su suppose, it's not just about ratio of false convictions to false acquittals or false con ratio of false convictions to overall cases or something like this or overall convictions. These aren't the things that the legal system should actually be worrying about. In that's just probabilistic likelihood. Instead, what a legal system should worry about is whether false convictions are an easy possibility. Are they something that could easily happen? So Pritchard's view is that for most bad outcomes, um, such as false convictions, being statistically unlikely and being modally distant go together. So on his view, for most bad outcomes, the fact that something is statistically unlikely simply reflects the fact that it's modally distant, so the world would have to be very different in order for that to obtain. But sometimes probabilistic unlikelihood and modal distance can come apart, where in those cases the statistical unlikelihood doesn't reflect modal distance, the outcome could easily happen, it could happen without a substantial change in the world, even though it's very unlikely. And perhaps a very clear case of this would be a lottery, a lottery examples. So to illustrate this difference, consider the following examples, which I've adapted from Pritchard. So case one, uh, an evil scientist says he's going to detonate a bomb in a crowded location if a particular ticket wins an enormous lottery. There's a, a 14 million tickets in the lottery. If, his, if the number comes up, he's going to detonate this bomb. Case two, an evil scientist says he's going to detonate a bomb in a crowded location if the following two events both occur. The lowest seeded team wins in the March Madness competition and Michael Williams is called up to play for centre forward for the Liverpool United match on Saturday. <laughs> so Pritchard says the combined outcome of those two is also extremely unlikely. He stipulates 14 million to one. I kind of I get a bit worried about those kinds of stipulations as you'll see. But he says, but we don't, we're not inclined to worry about that second kind of evil scientist. They're both unlikely, he says, they're both equally unlikely, but one is also modally distant, um, and so we don't have to worry about that. Um, returning to proof paradoxes. So Pritchard suggests that the low statistic statistical likelihood of false conviction in legal proceedings doesn't suffice for an appropriate legal verdict. In addition to it being unlikely, the, the unlikeliness has to also reflect modal distance. That second requirement has to happen. And in the prison paradox case, uh, in the uh, prison yard case, the bare statistical evidence the, um, means that the statistical unlikelihood doesn't reflect modal distance. <laughs> so in his terminology, the prison yard verdict uh, is the, one, the first case, the one based on statistic statistical evidence, is unsafe. That's his terminology. It could easily be wrong. His broader framework has recently evolved from this anti-luck epistemology to anti-risk epistemology. And if anyone's interested in the differences there, either ask me during the Q&A or ask me at some point during the conference and I can articulate to you the differences. The differences, as far as I can tell, don't affect the overall thing. So if you're just thinking in terms of anti-luck, you can just think along those lines for now. But the safety, the, the main apparatus of safety is the same. Okay, so to evaluate whether 
uh, true belief or verdict is safe, consider the nearest possible worlds in which you believe P. If there are nearby worlds where you're believing P but not P obtains, then the belief is unsafe. That's your test for safety and that's on, on your handout along with a, a wee definition of safety there. So the thought is that those uh, verdicts are too risky to qualify as knowledge, too risky to qualify as good legal verdicts. Now there are three ways that the safety condition could figure into, into this kind of resolution of the prison yard cases. So firstly, theorists might hold that knowledge is, re knowledge is required for legal verdicts, or a high probability of knowledge, which is something that Clayton's been um, thinking about, and also Michael Bloom Tillman has been thinking about. Um, or it could be another kind of epistemic kind, like justified belief or actionable information, whatever it is. I'm just going to say knowledge for now, but you know, there's this kind, kind of epistemic kind that's a really important one. That thing is required for appropriate legal verdicts. And then, uh, you know, that thing, knowledge, plays certain normative roles, like licenses incarceration, licenses blame, that kind of thing. And then safety is necessary for knowledge of that epistemic kind. So it's, it's knowledge that's doing the kind of normative, um, the normative work, but safety is required for knowledge or is characteristic of knowledge or something like that. So that's um, one way that safety could figure into an account here. Alternatively, you might say that it's safety as such that's key. So you might say safety is required for legal verdicts, and that's regardless of whether safety is required for knowledge, that's re regardless of whether knowledge is required for legal verdicts, safety is the thing that's really mattering here. Maybe. Uh, because it's the finality of legal verdicts or the high stakes, or maybe safety is just the hallmark of good judgment in general, or something like that. It's safety itself that matters. And I feel like that's kind of Pritchard's view. He's thinking like safety is this really important epistemic kind, does a lot of work, does the heavy lifting. The third account of the way that safety might fit in here is to say, well, it's not that, violate, it's not that violating safety exactly matters itself, but rather violations of safety are shorthand for something else has gone awry, something else serious is messed up here. So safety isn't, on this account, a direct feature of beliefs, but if a judgment is formed with bad evidence or an unfriendly environment or without requisite abilities or bad memory, bad testimony, then the, the belief will often be unsafe. Perhaps not always, as, as um, Ram has pointed out in one of his papers, but the thought is, typically, when other things have gone awry, safety is violated, safety doesn't obtain. Um, but then, so safety arises from these other errors, and it's the other errors that matter. They're the things that we care about, but safety is this useful shorthand. Now, I have a paper called Safety Swamp uh, Against the Epistemic Value of Safety, Modal, Against the Epistemic Value of Modal Conditions, something like this. But Safety Swamp is the, the, the main part of the title, where I argue, where I use this kind of thinking to suggest that. Uh, that, that, that safety doesn't really add any value to an already true belief. And so any view that explicitly posits a safety condition or knowledge is going to be faced with a kind of swamping problem, with a kind of failure to explain the modal, the, the, the epistemic value of knowledge, so uh, failing to explain the Mino problem. And that's because what we're really caring about is the good environment, the, the good abilities, the good evidence, that kind of thing. And safety is just kind of... Uh, um, these, thing, these things we care about gives rise to safety, but safety is not really doing the work. So, but you might give a kind of a non-skeptical, so my kind of account there is skeptical, the line that I'm pushing in that paper is skeptical, but you might give a non-skeptical version of that and say like, well it's true that, that safety is just a, um, the kind of collection of when these other anti-safety, uh, non-safety is when the collection of these other things go wrong, but really that's kind of still, that really matters, give a non-skeptical line. I worry about the skeptical line, but you might try to give that give that kind of account. Okay, so um, so regardless, and I think this will, safety, how safety fits in will, will sort of become more apparent, you know, why that would matter later, perhaps during the Q&A, but regardless of precisely how safety fits in, uh, notice that for Pritchard, exactly the same apparatus is going to apply to the prison yard case and to the lottery case. And that's important for my talk. The same explanation for be, can be given, the very same explanation is given for the lottery cases, explaining that lottery paradox, and for the prison yard cases, explaining that proof paradox. Does anyone here, you can just give like a little, like put your hand up or something, not know what the lottery paradox is? Okay, cool. So the lottery paradox is, suppose that there's a big old lottery that happens, uh, lots and lots and lots of 
tickets, say uh, 50,000 tickets, you, it seems like if you believe my lottery, my lottery ticket did not win, you're extremely likely to be right. That, that belief seems like it's going to be true. But the thought is there's something kind of funny about just thereby tearing up your ticket before you've even seen the results. It seems like that's not really the kind of thing that you should assert. You couldn't just say, oh, my ticket's not going to win. Because even though it's very likely to be true, there's something funny about asserting it. This kind of suggests that we don't know on this highly probabilifying evidence. That's kind of case one. Case two, it's a much, uh, it's a much, um, much, 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 much larger lottery. Lots and lots and lots and lots more tickets. And then you read in a newspaper the lottery tickets, and from that you infer my ticket didn't win. That seems like the kind of evidence that now you can assert my ticket um, didn't win. Uh, it seems like you can now throw away your ticket. Even though it could be, if the lottery is big enough, you're less likely to be right on that kind of evidence. And so that's kind of similar to the, um, to the proof paradox. So the merely statistical evidence doesn't cut it, but yet we can have this on the one hand, and then we have this individualized evidence, which does seem to cut it, even though you might be on that case more likely to have form a false belief. So that's the lottery paradox. Um, so very similar structure. So, and then the question is how similar is the structure really? When we really look at it, is it identical? Is the lottery paradox identical to the proof paradox? That's kind of part of the question that's driving this talk. So Pritchard's view understands the proof paradox as resolvable through the standard epistemology, just whatever applies to lottery. The lottery case. There's no appeal to moral considerations, so, so, social considerations, distinctive features of the legal system. It doesn't make a difference that these are people, uh, the beliefs are about people that have a moral interest, moral patience, um, moral um, status. <coughs> and so notice that to do this, the approach needs to construe the proof paradox as very much like a lottery paradox perhaps even identical to one. So the false belief is modally close and the fact that the belief is about agents has dropped out of the picture entirely. The prison yard could be replaced by beads cascading down a golden board. Or a golden board is one of these uh, boards where there's lots of pins in it, lots and lots of pins, and then you drop the beads down. And they kind of, the thought is that they sort of randomly go left or right. This is like the prison yard people could just be like that with just a distribution at the end. And you might begin to wonder here because you might think something like, well, wait a minute, if you asked the prisoners beforehand, one of them might be able to tell you, no, I wouldn't write it in that circumstance. So it's beginning to feel a little bit like maybe there's something funny there because it's not entirely like a lottery. That was what I began to think anyway. Okay, so the question is, is treating the proof paradox as epistemically resolvable like a lottery paradox legitimate and is it desirable? And so to address this question, I want to first turn to a pair of cases that uh, are discussed by Lara Buchak in her 2014 paper. And these, ca these cases are on your handout. It's kind of the end of the first page and then the top of the second page are the, are the one and two of this, of this um, iPhone case. So the iPhone case. Your iPhone is stolen and you know that only two people had access to the building, Jake and Barbara. You also know that when iPhones are stolen, nine times out of ten, the thief is a man. That's the first case. <coughs> Uh, the second case is your iPhone is stolen. You know that only two people have access to the building, Jake and Barbara. Men and women steal iPhones at equal rates. But an eyewitness from a long distance says she believes that she saw Jake uh, steal the phone. So again, similar structure now to the lottery case and the proof paradox case, uh, to the prison yard case. So Buchak treats this case as having an identical structure to the original proof paradox case, so identical to the prison yard case. She writes, and I quote, here's another case, as the prison yard case, with the same, same form that seems to prompt the same intuitions, end quote. So in both the prison yard case and the iPhone case, the bare statistical evidence isn't sufficient, but the other individualized evidence could be. And on Buchak's view, the crucial question is whether the evidence supports belief or whether it merely supports a very high credence. Uh, the thought is that bare statistical evidence can support very high credence, but it doesn't typically support belief. And then Buchak continues uh, that belief and high credence play different normative roles. And so what matters for the prison yard case and for the iPhone case is the same kind of thing. High credences 
can support betting type behavior, actions that have self-interested or some kinds of other interested outcomes, good and bad outcomes. This is the domain of things like expected utility theory, whether to take an umbrella with you that, uh, when you go out, head out to work, that kind of thing. But these very high credences don't support other kinds of things, such as reactive attitudes, blame, punishment, incarceration. She also suggests at one point that maybe they don't support any kind of character evaluations at all. As she notes, you can't half blame somebody on a high-ish credence that they wronged you. That's not appropriate on her view. The thing is that you have to do is have a full belief that they wronged you and then you can blame them. So Buchak treats the iPhone case as a simple two-person paradox. And given her resolution, uh, this, this kind of seems fine for her view, although I'm going to return to that and maybe raise a question there for her view. But this got me, so this got me thinking, is this kosher? Is the iPhone case simply a two-person paradox? And just as a side note, I don't want to, this is side note, I don't want to definitively pin on Buchak that she does hold that the iPhone case is simply a two-person paradox, because I haven't asked her. Um, it seems like she does in her paper because she just identifies the same epistemic flaws and she sort of says the same epistemic resolution. But note that um, judgments can have more than one flaw. So just because you've picked out one flaw uh, doesn't mean that there aren't other flaws. And by the way, side note on a side note, I think that's a really important point in this kind of literature and in general, just because you've picked up one problem with something like profiling, it doesn't mean you've picked out all of the problems. Okay, um, back to the first side note. So uh, it seems like she does think that they're the same, but um, given what she's written in her paper, but I just, you know, I haven't asked her, so I don't want to tell you that that's what she thinks. But it does seem like it from the way that she, write, that she wrote her 2014 paper. Okay, so away from the side notes, is the iPhone case simply a two-person pr uh, proof paradox? So I think that there's a real chance that the answer is no. And to see why, apply Pritchard's resolution of the proof paradox to the iPhone case. So what does he say about the prison yard case? Apply that to the iPhone case. So suppose you believe that Jake jacked the iPhone based on the bare statistical evidence, the base rates. Is your belief safe? Well, this depends on the modal features of Jake's, of Jake's theft. But plausibly, it isn't a lottery. It's not just a random chance whether or not it was Jake or Barbara that stole the phone. So the headline for this upcoming section that I'm going to be hopefully trying to motivate the following kind of headline thought is that whether Jake stole the iPhone is not a lottery. The case involves profiling and profiling has different epistemic and moral features from mere statistical lottery chances. So to understand the modal features of Jake's theft we have to look at what underwrites this 9 out of 10 statistic. Listen, every time I, where 9 out of 10 times when an iPhone is stolen, it's stolen by man. What underwrites that? So now I'm going to turn to stipulative epidemiology. Uh, and this is to explore the underlying modal structure of statistical demographic patterns. So there's three diseases, A, B, and C. Fact one, 80% of the people that have disease A are male. Fact two, 80% of the people that have disease B are male. Fact three, 80% of the people that have disease C are male. So at some level there's no statistical difference between facts one through, three, one through three. But there is a difference about what causes the statistic in each case, what underwrites the statistic in each case. So with disease A there's a scale and disease A marks a threshold on that scale. So suppose, this is stipulative, um, stipulative epidemiology. Suppose that disease A means regulates sugar poorly, in, uh, sh re uh, regulates sugar poorly to, to a certain degree, to a certain threshold. So lots of people regulate poorly, sugar poorly to some degree or other. And what gives rise to statistic one is that men tend to do so worse than women. So sort of generally in the population, we all do it to, to poorly to some degree or other. Men tend to be worse, and so men, more men have exceeded that threshold of qualifying as disease A. So it's something like type 2 diabetes, but I mean this is stipulative epidemiology, so I'm going to just stipulate that it's type 2 diabetes. Uh, so, um, yeah, so males generally tend to be worse at regulating sugar, so men tend to qualify for disease A more often. Okay, disease B, the condition is binary, so you either have, this is for illustration, you either have colon cancer or you don't, but something about male anatomy makes it more susceptible to colon cancer. So more males get it, because, um, and even the males that don't get it, the thought is they might well get it, they're at risk, they have this susceptible body shape. 
So female ten bodies just tend to be a bit more protected against it, a bit less likely to get it, that kind of thought. So if you have a male friend and a female friend where neither have it, it's the male that you would worry about, the male where you'd be hoping that they get regular checkups, that kind of thing. Something to do with the shape of something or other in the uh, lower torso. So, uh, so it's, the thought is it's a closer possibility. You worry more about the, the male friend. Okay, so with disease C, uh, it's also binary. More males have it than females. But those males who don't contract disease C are no more prone to disease C than females without disease C. So the underlying causation is something like this. There's a habit, a uh, habit H, and more males than females tend to develop habit H. And then habit H correlates really strongly with disease C. And those males who don't have habit H are just like very disinclined towards habit H. And so the thought is that they're, and that they're, so they're just sort of not particularly likely to pick up habit H. And, and then habit H is this thing that really strongly correlates with disease C. That was kind of abstract, so I'm going to give you a, an illustrative thought that you can now pin to that structure that I just laid out there, but it might be a bit too abstract to really pick up on. So think of habit H as like chewing tobacco. And think of disease C as gum cancer or mouth cancer. The thought is that men are much more likely to chew tobacco than women. And then in the stipulative epidemi epidemiology, um, there aren't many causes to mouth cancer, to gum cancer, except chewing tobacco really rely like, often causes it. That's the kind of picture I have in mind. I haven't yet settled on any of these diseases, but I thought, you know, disease C is kind of, uh, habit H is like juggling fireworks, and disease C is like having your hands blown off by fireworks. Like, men are just more likely to do that. <laughs> Women are just like not so inclined to do habit H, juggle fireworks. But also the men that don't juggle fireworks, they're not like, I'm kind of tempted, I might actually just do that tomorrow, who knows. Uh, there's like, but it does seem, there seems to be this funny pattern, like skateboarding, off roofs, like these kinds of things. Um, I, th I think that probably that there's going to be some like rather more boring thing where habit H is actually just replaced by something chromoso chromosomal or genetic or something, and then disease C is some similarly boring thing. But for now, we can think of the juggling fireworks. Okay, so even though statistical gender distribution is the same, the modal patterns are different. The common statistics disguise these modal patterns that I think make an epistemological difference, and they certainly make an epistemological difference to something like a safety account, or at least that's my thought. So if you believe, if you form the belief that Manuel has disease X based on the fact that he's a man, and then this bare statistical fact that... Um, then is that the you know, this uh, best fact about the demographics? Then we can. Then is your belief safe? And remember, we can only evaluate the safety of a true belief here. Well, if he has disease C, your belief is plausibly safe. So the nearest world in which he's not diseased is a non-habit world. And plausibly, if he has the habit, then non-habit worlds are relatively distant. I just realised, by the way, that. Um, You'd also have to assume that these, these diseases A, B, and C are quite common. I've just realized that would be a part of the assumption that I hadn't appreciated before. Um, but to get it that just on the basis that somebody is a man that they, that they sort of have it, you actually need to have the, the common disease. I hadn't quite um, thought that through yet. So just add that, that the A, B, and C are kind of common. Um, okay, so, so if, you're, if it's disease C that you're um, thinking about, then, then your belief is plausibly safe. So, in the, so he has it. So in the nearest worlds in which he's not, not diseased are non-habit worlds. And then plausibly, if he has that habit, then the non-habit worlds are relatively distant. Uh, so that's a thought. If it's the, if it's the, we're evaluating the safety of the belief, so the belief is true. Given that he has it, he has it in the nearby worlds. And then the, the worlds where he doesn't have the disease are quite far away. If the belief concerns disease B, by contrast, well, he has the at-risk shape, but plausibly he might well not have contracted the disease. There's some sense that diseases like cancer have a certain randomness to them, a certain luck of the jaw. So you can imagine that there are twins that have the same body shape, same parents, same environmental conditions, same habit, exercise and diet and so on, and one of them develops breast cancer and the other one doesn't. That doesn't seem so strange. It seems like it's the kind of thing where there is like a luck of the jaw about that. A bit of modal closeness, like this kind of it could be you of, of breast cancer. So it seems like uh, your belief about Manuel with regard to belief B would be less safe, at least relative to disease 
S. Your, relative, your belief about disease B is, is relatively unsafe, at least compared to disease C. With disease A, the safety of the belief, I think, is more complicated to evaluate. I think we don't have enough information. So Manuel could well be borderline for the disease threshold. So in that case, in many nearby possibilities, he doesn't have the disease. And so the belief isn't safe. On the other hand, he might well be located well into the diabetes end of the scale, in which case it's a quite a safe belief because in all the nearby worlds, the thought is he'll also have it because he's really poor at regulating sugar. Okay, so suppose Manuel doesn't have the disease. Now look at the modal profile of that. If it's disease C, Manuel doesn't have habit H, so plausibly he's no more risk than an arbitrary non-habit woman. He only has the disease in these distant worlds, these um, non-habit, these habit, having the habit H worlds. With disease B, uh, Manuel doesn't have the disease, but he's still at risk. So plausibly, even if he doesn't have it in nearby worlds, he could, because of this luck of the draw, it could be you kind of idea. With disease A, as above, it depends on where along this scale of regulating sugar he is. If he's close to the threshold, then even though he doesn't have it in nearby worlds, he would. And I'm talking about nearby worlds um, here. If this is kind of giving you the heebie-jeebies, just replace that with sort of talk of distant possibilities, close to possibilities, that kind of thing. Um, I just sort of tend to talk in worlds, but I think everything can be translated into just talk of close possibilities and distant possibilities. So since the iPhone case involves crime, not disease, we'd need to look at the modal structure underlying this 9 out of 10 figure for iPhone thefts, this kind of demographic uh, figure that Buchak stipulates. And the modal pattern is going to give rise, is going to depend on what's causing that distribution. Now, of course, the figure is made up, but I thoroughly invite people to stipulate or speculate uh, underlying causal crime differences with gender differenti differentiations. Uh, speculate away. Uh, please do. Um, I'm not going to do that. But I will say this. If there's a large gender difference in crime, I'm not going to do that because I'm being recorded. <laughs> <laughs> if there's a large gender difference in crime, like the one that Buchak stipulates in her example, it's very unlikely to be a pure chance random situation. I think it's hard to imagine diseases where there's this 80-20 gender split as a pure random lottery. The thought is, if there's a gender split, something's giving rise to it, so it's not just a lottery case. I did think of a disease D that seems like there could be a gender split, and um, yet it's pure random chance. This is it. So this is disease D. Completely, random re completely randomly radiation passes through the Earth, the kind of radiation that the people at CERN were picking up on. But this radiation does interfere with stuff. In particular, it interferes with uh, blood cells. And if it hits blood cells, it causes cancer. Uh, so it's like a radiation lottery. If the radiation comes through the earth and it comes through your body, then it, it causes cancer. And then what explains the gender differential is men have a lot more blood cells than women. And so men have more tickets in this radiation lottery. Tickets are blood cells, winning is cancer. So that is, that is disease D, this uh, very stipulative, but the thought is there's a gender difference and yet it is, it is like a lottery case. But the thought is, you know, you have to kind of think about a case like that for a little while. That's an abnormal case. Most cases where there's going to be a gender split, something's giving rise to it. It's not a lottery case. The fact I can come up with lottery cases is not like giving people license to think that any time, you know, that everything's just a lottery, right? That's kind of the thought here. So the key point is that the prison yard case is plausibly construed as a lottery, perhaps illegitimately, and that's something that I'll return to, I'd suggest briefly towards the end. But the iPhone case can't be construed as a lottery. It can't just be, oh, lottery case structure. The iPhone case involves profiling, and this is essential to the case. And so then this, the question arises as soon as you sort of hear the case, well, what gives rise to the demographic difference? And you began to begin to think about things like men have more of a propensity towards iPhone theft. There's something kind of going on in the character. It's more kind of normal for them that it would be the man than the woman. These kinds of things, these non-statistical things, these non-lottery things. And again, you need iPhone theft. At least to be thinking things like, well, it's normal for, the, for a man to do it. You might need... Uh, quite a high rate of iPhone, iPhone theft. And one of the things that in my moral encroachment paper I bring up is even if there is a racial difference in crime participation, 
if crime participation is really, 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 really low, or just really low, uh, then it doesn't really tell you anything about any gender, any race difference. If, I mean, of any particular, it, um, if, if very tiny, tiny number of people do a particular crime, even if there's a race difference, it's not really telling you anything. That's the kind of thought. But if there's, if there's, a, a, if there's a kind of difference that will give rise to these kinds of puzzles, like this 9 out of 10, and the percentages are kind of relatively high, then it begins to tell you something. In the race crime stuff, I think the percentages aren't that high. That's kind of a bit of an aside from the moral encroachment paper, which if you're sticking around on Wednesday, I'm going to be discussing in the concept centre. Um, Okay, so on Buchak's view, we can treat the cases largely alike. Um, the, the, all three cases, they just say it's the same thing. It's that we can't form a judgment based on statistical evidence. Um, we need non-statistical evidence and we don't have that. But on Pritchard's view, a chasm appears. In the lottery and prison yard cases, the verdict has a defect. So the verdict and the particular verdict is that it's unsafe on the available evidence we're wrong in modal nearby worlds. But when we consider the iPhone case, we have to confront the fact that if Jake stole the phone, he plausibly stole the phone in nearby worlds. Theft isn't typically random. I mean, it might be opportunistic and it might be unplanned, but it's not a lottery between Jake and Barbara where the thought is it's 80% chance that Jake stole it and it's just a lottery at, at the time. So if the iPhone case isn't compelling, think of the modal profile of sexual assault. So the thought is if it's the same kind of thing, but you walk into the building and you just learn that one of the two committed a sexual assault, the thought is that if you believe the man did it, based on the demographic statistics and the fact he's a man, the belief is safe. I'm not saying it's justified, I'm just saying it, is, it would be safe. Am I reading this right, that I just have, n that I have n about seven minutes left, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, so if what I've articulated is on the right path, this suggests that Pritchard's uh, safety account can explain why the prison yard cases aren't warranted. Or at least that's what his claim is. I mean, you might doubt that. Um, but it's at the danger of leaving this kind of profiling epistemically kosher. Nothing wrong with the, the profiling there. You get safe beliefs. So I think one can use what I've articulated to aim criticisms at either Pritchard or Buchak. Um, and I'm going to spell out the thrust of those criticisms. I'm not going to pursue them, but if you did want to pursue criticisms. I think sometimes philosophers like to do that. If you're a pursuing criticism kind of a person, here's a couple of criticisms that you could pursue. So I've talked about attuning to what gives rise to a demographic statistic, and I've suggested that people's behavior in a lot of cases doesn't resemble a lottery in most cases, in normal cases. So you might then think that it's a mistake to treat the prison yard as epistemically similar to lotteries as Pritchard does. So perhaps the true verdicts um, that you form in the prison yard case are safe. So the individuals who riot would riot in nearby possibilities. And then the only epistemic flaw left to Pritchard is the very ordinary vanilla flaw that one of your beliefs is false. Safety kind of drops out of the picture. Um, so I'm curious about people's thoughts on that, whether that's a bit kind of a worry that people are beginning to have about his resolution to the prison yard pair of cases, that actually the beliefs are safe. It's just that one of them is false. Um, alternatively, a theorist might now... Um, aim launch criticisms at Buchak, well you might think, well Buchak is mistaken in thinking that all you have in the iPhone case is credence, because all you have is mere statistical evidence. The, the discussion that I was sort of going through with the diseases suggests that if there's a big gender crime difference, then it isn't merely probability like a, li like a lottery. If, the, if you have the iPhone case set up as it is, you don't just have mere statistical evidence, you have something else going on. Um, the thought is that whether something's a lottery or not isn't just a function of your ignorance. You can't just think, well, I don't know anything about what would give rise to that, so it's a lottery. Seems like that doesn't make it a lottery. So, I'm, like I said, I'm not going to pursue those criticisms there, but that's kind of ways that you might go. So, safety diagnoses the lottery and the prison yard cases, maybe illegitimately, but they seem to diagnose the cases, but it doesn't impugn the beliefs about the iPhone the iPhone cases. Sensitivity differs on this score. So sensitivity, this idea that um, in the nearest, so a belief is sensitive if in the nearest worlds where not P, your belief is not P, so you're tracking the truth about whether or not P. Um, the sensitivity condition will diagnose all three judgments as not warranted and not warranted for the same reason 
namely the judgment isn't sensitive. So if your evidence is statistics, is gender, is that kind of thing, in all three cases, the nearest worlds were not P, uh, you still believe P, so it's an insensitive belief. And um, sensitivity, by the way, is Enoch, Spectra and Fisher's diagnosis of the prison, prison cases for people that are... Um, I mentioned that since I'm bringing up sensitivity in the, in, the, in the prison yard case. I should mention that's their diagnoses. So this raises two questions. Is the verdict warranted in each of the three cases? That's one question. Do we, is it um, fine in one of those three cases or is it not fine in, in any of those cases? The second question is, do we want a unified account of the epistemology in those three cases? So roughly speaking, are the epistemic features displayed in all three cases the same? Are the same epistemic tools going to do the heavy lifting, the explanatory work in all three cases? And those questions can come apart. They're independent questions. So it might be that the same epistemic features do the explanatory work, but what they're explaining is why you can believe in the profiling case and can't in the iPhone case and you can't in the other two. So to illustrate there, plausibly, the safety account holds that you shouldn't judge in the first two cases, the lottery and the prison yard case, but perhaps you can in the iPhone case. And the safety condition is explaining all three of those. And then as mentioned above, it looks like sensitivity is saying that none of the three beliefs are warranted, verdicts are warranted, and for the same epistemic reason, that violations of sensitivity. Um, to illustrate how, they might apply, how you might apply radically different epistemological tools to the three cases, I'm going to survey some recent development, very briefly survey some recent developments in epistemology. Because I think this is kind of orthodoxy in epistemology, I mean in theorizing in general, that if your posit can explain more things, then that makes it a better posit, right? Look at this, you just have to buy safety and I can explain all this stuff, right? That seems like it's a a good thing about a theory, but there, might, but there might, but there's this kind of emerging maybe idea that, that um, as I'll try to motivate, that, that explaining them all in the same way is actually making a mistake, and a, a theorizing a mistake, maybe a, even a moral mistake. So that's the kind of thought that I want to try to motivate here. So uh, I should note that I'm just going to very, very quickly say these moral encroachment views, not a very careful exposition by any stretch. Come on Wednesday for a more careful exposition. So moral encroachment holds that the moral features of a belief can affect the epistemic justification of that belief. So here's some, how some moral encroachment views might apply to those three cases. So Rima Basu and Mark Schroeder would likely argue that the prison yard case and the iPhone case have these high moral stakes, high moral stakes, and so you need more evidence in order for the belief to be justified. And that could hold, and that doesn't say anything about the lottery case, you'd need like a different account to say whether or not you have justified belief in the lottery case, because moral encroachment is not going to say anything about the lottery case. It's not going to say, well, there's no moral stakes, so believe what you like. That's like not, 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 what, the moral, not what that view is going to have, it's just going to have different epistemological widgets to explain the lottery case, whether or not that's belief. Note that Basu might hold that the iPhone case and then the sexual assault variant that I mentioned uh, she might hold that they don't have high moral stakes because the person that you would be um, accusing is male and so they're not a member of a, of a margin socially marginalised group. So Basu might differ there and I can sort of go more into that in the Q&A but I just want to pr quickly sketch how that, again, how these different accounts will bring up different kinds of ep epistemological widgets. Bollinger holds that for at least some kinds of inference, you epistemically ought not use impermissible signals as evidence, and that includes things like race and gender. So the thought is, even if race correlates really strongly in a particular area with being staff, you can't use the fact that of a, the race to, to infer that they're staff, but you can for, with uniforms, even if uniforms are actually kind of less probative in the orthodox sense of bearing on whether or not they're staff. But the thought is, according to Bollinger, that's not just a moral mistake, that's an epistemic mistake. So she might well hold that uh, you can't believe that Jake stole the iPhone based on his gender and the background demographics, but so, so the Jake one you're using this impermissible signal uh, gender, but then the lottery belief and the and the I the lottery belief and perhaps also the prison yard case there are no impermissible signals in play, and so maybe you can form beliefs in that case. Again, you'd need to do a different epistemological work. Uh, similarly, Moss suggests when forming beliefs about people, the possibility that the individual will differ from others in their reference class is a salient relevant alternative, but, and it's one that you haven't ruled out. So the moral consideration, the moral fact that you have to bear this in mind, makes it salient, since you haven't ruled it out, that undermines knowledge. 
And so uh, the thought is there that the prison yard case and the iPhone case will come out as unjustified on that account. Again, that doesn't say anything about the lottery case. So moral encroachment views such as these, and there's more than what I just quickly sketched, of course, will hold that if you, if you treat all three cases alike, you're thereby missing something important. You're missing something morally important, you're missing something epistemologically important, you're making a mistake if you think, well, whatever, so whatever says we can't believe in the, sense, in the lottery case, that's the reason that we shouldn't believe in the profiling case. These people will be like, no, 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 you're like really missing out some normative reality there. And notice also that the order of warrantedness seems to be inverted from the ordinary orthodox epistemology. So orthodox epistemology will typically say something like, uh, the lottery case, you have very little to go on. Suppose now that the numbers are all just the same, it's like one in a 50 chance that, that um, your belief is false, just for the illustration. The orthodox epistemology will say, well, the lottery case, you have very little to go on, very little evidence indeed, less warranted. Profiling, you have more to go on because of this kind of normative, this uh, modal structure, more justified, more like warranted. This moral encroachment thing is kind of inverting that and saying, well, there's very little to go on, so maybe the belief is fine. But as soon as you're bringing in this, this like, more robust social stuff, now all this other stuff, kick, all these other considerations kick in, these moral encroachment um, considerations, and now the belief is less epistemically justified, so it's inverted that or more orthodox understanding of, of the cases. Again, then finally, of course, many legal epistemologists um, will hold that the legal verdicts answer to specific epistemic legal demands, and so whatever this kind of this flat-footed, this flat-footed, flat-footed legal scholar will say, well, whatever epistemology has to say about the iPhone case and the um, the lottery case, whatever it says about that, is going to be a different epistemic account, account that we have to give for the prison yard case. Why? Well, the prison yard case is legal, so we bring in beyond reasonable doubt. Beyond reasonable doubt, does, beyond reasonable, beyond reasonable doubt doesn't apply to what you think about. Jake or what you think about the lottery, it's an epistemic demand that applies to that prison yard case. The reason I've called that flat footed, I think that's a, you know, that's a important point, the reason I've called it flat footed is um, there does seem to be epistemological differences in the sense of, well, if you made the iPhone case into a legal case where you now apply like a beyond reasonable doubt, there's still differences going on with the, the evidence, the modal, I've suggested the modal space, that kind of thing. So there still are epistemological differences in addition to that one. And when you turn the other two cases somehow into legal cases, or turn the prison yard case into just a belief knowledge case rather than a legal case, there's still questions about to what extent they're epistemologically different and similar. Okay, and all of the cases, um, all the ways that I've dealt with so far are all talking about the specifically epistemic treatments. So there's going to be a whole family of other views that say something like, um, well, like in the iPhone case, yeah, it's epistemically justified, but it's morally unjustified. Or you might say, well, the lottery case is morally kosher, that's fine, but it's epistemically unjustified. I've abstracted, I've set aside all of those cases. I'm just talking about the epistemic normativity, the epistemic justification. Okay, it's orthodoxy to articulate a conclusion or two at the end of a paper. <laughs> really been aiming at conclusions. I've kind of more been aiming at uh, questions or maybe even kind of rather than attempting to elucidate an area, make it more confusing. You know, because Duncan Pritchard still says, well, it's very simple. You just apply safety. And I've been saying, like, oh, it's a bit of a mess. It so I'm kind of hoping that you guys ideally thought that you made, that you understood stuff and now don't, which is an unusual hope for the end of a paper. Insofar as I'm, I'll just articulate one conclusion, which is I think we have to be careful with these vignettes, not to just stipulate away too much. That's kind of been a theme of some of my other work. Um, but I think it's particularly the case with stipulating just uh, statistics and percentages. I think there's a lot going underneath, on underneath the surface in cases when you make stipulations. Uh, percentages can seem simple, but they're really not. So I guess that's my conclusion, is be a little bit careful about stipulating percentages. 